Hello and welcome to DI, your English news bulletin. I'm Esther. These are the headlines. The government of Nagaland has announced Unlock 2, part of the gradual lifting of lockdown restrictions across the state, starting from July 11th till the 17th. In another shocking incident regarding child abuse, Childline Mohok Chung has reported a case against a lady for allegedly physically abusing a minor with a hammer and knife. Twelve people have been arrested in Bengaluru in connection with the gang rape and brutal torture of a Bangladeshi woman in the month of May. Now for the news in details. The government of Nagaland has announced Unlock 2, part of the gradual lifting of lockdown restrictions across the state, starting from July 11th. The spokesperson for the government's high-powered committee, HPC for COVID-19, Munla Mokekon, informed, informed on Thursday, July 8th, that the committee has taken the decision to start lifting restrictions. The restriction will start from July 11th and will continue up to July 17th, the district task forces are to be issued revised standard operating procedures. Further, select train services will be allowed to resume. In another shocking incident regarding child abuse, Chai Line Mohok Chung has reported a case against a lady for physically abusing a minor. Chai Line Mohok Chung informed Hornbill TV that the child, 11 years old, in age is a relative of the lady and came to live with her in the month of April. The NGO informed that they received a call reporting of the abuse against the child after which the child was rescued from Sangtamla Ward, Mokokchung. According to Childline, the child had inflicted injuries in her head, forehead, lips and hand. The child's statement and medical report say that the weapons used to have inflicted the bruises were a hammer and knife which were heated in fire to cut the child's arms. The child, before the police and child line team, stated it wasn't just once, but was abused many times previously. After rescuing the child from the culprit's residence at Sangtamla Ward, child line team took the victim to the hospital as she needed medical attention and is now under the care of the NGO. Child line on 7 July filed an FIR against the culprit. The culprit has admitted of the abuse in her statement and was detained on July 7 by the women's cell only later to be released on PR bond. In this regard, an official from the women's police station in Mokokchong has informed that this is a non-cognizable offence and the court is yet to give permission for arrest. This is a developing story. Stay tuned with Hornbill TV for more. Japan-based Nippon Foundation reached out to the government of Manipur and donated 100 oxygen concentrators through Manipur Tourism Forum to the Chief Minister's COVID-19 Relief Fund as a support to the state's government's effort in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's have a look at the details. Manipur is facing stiff COVID challenges as the northeastern state has continuously seen more than 600 COVID positive cases on a daily basis for the last several days. In fact, the central government has already sent an expert team to look into the matter. Nippon Foundation in Japan is a reputed organization known for extending help to India in times of crisis in many occasions. Founder President Manipur Tourism Forum Dr. T. H. Dabali Singh handed over the oxygen concentrators to Chief Minister N. Birain Singh at the Chief Minister's Secretary. Secretariat in the presence of Principal Secretary, Health and Family Welfare, V. Vumlung Mang, and Director Health Services, Dr. K. Rajo. On receiving the oxygen concentrators, the Chief Minister expressed gratitude and thanked the Nippon Foundation and further stated that the oxygen concentrators received would be helpful in dealing with the deadly pandemic prevailing in the state. Also, a press statement released by Chief Minister Secretariat says, Tambal Mari College, which is located in Oinam in Taubal district of Manipur, had also donated one day salary of its staff amounting to 270,130 rupees to the relief fund. The chief minister also extended his gratitude for the contribution. Over 600 citizens participated in the signature campaign organized by Kohima District Congress Committee on Thursday in Kohima. The signature campaign is being organized in various locations in and around Kohima as a form of agitation against the unprecedented hike of prices in petrol, diesel and essential commodities. The protest is being conducted in the form of banners, stickers besides signature campaign. 
It will go on till the 17th of July, it was informed. The agitation, which was called by All India Congress Committee, is being observed throughout the country to protest against the spiraling hike of prices in fuel products and various household items. On Thursday, party members from Congress braved the rain and conducted signature campaigns at Congress Bhavan, SKV Petrol Pump and Sekose Petrol Pump, KDCC informed. They further informed Hornbill TV that within two hours on Thursday morning, 200 stickers in the state capital have already been used up, adding that they would be procuring more stickers for Friday's activities as well. KV Vizo, president of KDCC, while speaking to the channel, expressed happiness that citizens are responding positively towards the signature campaign. He also hoped that the agitation which is being initiated for the welfare of the people will be successful with more cooperation from the citizens. We also informed that at the end of the signature campaign, they will submit a memorandum along with the signatures from the citizens to R. N. Ravi, the governor of Nagaland, on July 16. Besides the ongoing agitation, Congress party workers in Kohima are also organizing a registration drive for citizens to avail COVID-19. In more local news, a church in Old Jaluki reportedly burned to the ground early on Thursday morning around 2 a.m. The pastor of the church informed that the cause of the fire was due to a short circuit and could not be salvaged on time as everyone was asleep and the fire was learned about much later. He added that the Thatch House Church was around 24 years old and was burned to the ground completely. The Timinu SDPDB meeting was held on 8th July at ADC's conference hall, Timinu under the chairmanship of ADC Timinu, Man Pai Pom, NCS. The House deliberated on special awareness and vaccination camps for government employees in the subdivision. It also recommended for, for forwarding of Shajuchu Welfare Society at Sunyu to the government for registration. The House decided to organize a mass social work by all the offices on 7th August 2021, where every department will adopt and nurture few of the 100 cherry tree saplings that were recently planted in commemoration of the 50 years of Timon New, New Town. For the coming Independence Day celebration, the House decided to await further instructions from the government. Agenda on upgradation of Government High School, Kandinu, will be taken up in the next meeting. After the big union cabinet reshuffle on Wednesday, Prime Minister Narendra Modi today began work with the new ministers. Today, the Prime Minister interacted with directors of centrally funded technical institutions like IIT Bombay, IIT Madras, IIT Kanpur and IISC Bangalore through video conferencing. New Education Minister Dharmendra Pradhan was also part of the interaction. The interaction is part of PM Modi's personal efforts to ensure that education institutions further improve, sources said. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Wednesday effected a major reshuffle and expansion of his Council of Ministers. The expansion saw more representation to states which will go to the polls next year including Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat and are apparently aimed at infusing more young talent in the government. While the representation of OBCs, SCs and youth has gone up, the average age of cabinet has come down. The changes were made days ahead of the monsoon session of parliament. 43 ministers, including seven who were elevated as cabinet ministers, took the oath of office at a function at Rashtrapati Bhavan held with protocols related to COVID-19. The Delhi Commission for Protection for Child Rights, or the DCPCR, has issued a notice to the three civic bodies and sought details of teacher posts lying vacant following a war of words between the BJP and the Aam Admi Party over pupil-teacher ratios in Delhi's primary schools. Deputy Chief Minister Sisodia has alleged that the weak pupil-teacher ratio in Delhi's primary level of schooling, as seen in the UDISE Plus 2019-20 report, can largely be attributed to the BJP-run municipal corporations. He stated almost half of all primary schools run by municipal corporations do not meet the Right to Education Act 2009 requirements on pupil-teacher ratios. In turn, the BJP claimed teacher recruitment is low as the Delhi government is withholding funds. The PTR refers to the number of students for each teacher arrived at by dividing the total number of teachers to each student. According to the Right to Education Act 2009, the pupil-teacher ratio should be 30 is to 1 or one teacher for every 30 students. 
The DCPCR has now issued notices to all three corporations over insufficient teachers, citing media reports on Sisodia's remark, stating that it has decided to conduct an inquiry into the alleged violation of the Right to Education Act. The notices ask the schools to submit school-wise data on the number of teaching positions lying vacant in schools run and aided by the local body concerned and classify them as a regular, guest and contract teachers. In other news, scientists have identified a novel target for a drug that can treat the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19 and also help tackle a future coronavirus pandemic. The researchers at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in the U.S. noted that scientists should prepare for a possible next coronavirus pandemic. The latest study published in the journal Science Signaling provides a critical information that could aid drug development against future coronaviruses as well as SARS-CoV-2. There is great need for new approaches to drug discovery to combat the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 pandemic and infections from future coronaviruses, Satchel said. The idea behind the future drug would be that it works early in the infection. The goal, researchers said, is to stop the virus early before people get too sick. The team worked to generate key information about this protein and is collaborating with chemists who will use their formation to design drugs against the protein. The Supreme Court on Thursday said that Delhi Assembly can seek information from Facebook and its officials in connection with their alleged role in the 2020 Delhi riots, but the social media platform cannot be compelled to answer on issues relating to law and order and any other subject which falls under the center's domain. The court was delivering its verdict on a plea filed by Facebook India Vice President and MD Ajit Mohan and others challenging the summons issued by Delhi Assembly Peace and Harmony Committee for failing to appear before it as a witness in connection with the Northeast Delhi riots matter. A bench headed by Justice Sanjay Kishan Call emphasized that Facebook officials can choose not to answer questions which are beyond the scope of legislative powers of the Delhi Assembly. The top court upheld Delhi Assembly's powers to constitute a committee to examine the Delhi riots of 2020, but made it clear that the committee cannot act as a prosecuting agency. The bench said that the Delhi Assembly itself has no jurisdiction over the law and order situation and the police. Therefore, the Peace and Harmony Committee cannot examine criminal cases and the nature of evidence in connection with the riots. The top court made it clear that if the Facebook official decides to appear before the committee, that official cannot be forced to answer questions and the committee for this action could not proceed in breach of privilege of the House against the official. Twelve people have been arrested in Bengaluru in connection with the gang rape and brutal torture of a Bangladeshi woman. Let's have a look at the details. Bengaluru Police Commissioner Kamal Pan tweeted today that the investigation was completed in a short period of five weeks. The indictment in the case has also gone to court, Mr. Pan tweeted. He praised the investigation team for the work and said that a reward of Rs 1 lakh has been sanctioned to the team. The attack took place in May this year. A disturbing video of the woman being assaulted was circulated on social media in which the accused even put a bottle in her private parts. Later, the 22-year-old woman was allegedly gang raped. Police said the rape victim was smuggled out of Bangladesh three years ago by a network of human traffickers operating in her country, Assam, West Bengal, Telangana and Karnataka. After this, the gang forced her into prostitution. After a financial dispute, the accused allegedly harassed and gang raped her. As per the information revealed so far, they are all part of the same group and are believed to be from Bangladesh. Due to financial differences, the perpetrators brutally beat up the victim, also known as Bangladeshi, for human trafficking. The Bengaluru police said in a statement that they have registered a case against the accused under sections of rape, assault and other sections. Three accused who allegedly tried to escape during investigation and arrest were shot and injured by the police in the last two months. The government has issued warnings against overcrowding popular tourist destinations, but that seems to be having little effect on tourists. Days after shocking pictures from Manali showed crowded streets and zero regard to social distancing norms, now tourists have gathered in Uttarakhand. Videos have emerged on social media which show tourists bathing at Missouri's famous Kempty Falls. 
Social distancing went for a toss as people gathered at the popular tourist spot. Not even a single person was seen wearing a mask in the videos. Hotels were full and there were long queues of vehicles on the streets as people escaped to the hills in order to beat the summer heat. Stunned by the videos, many took jibes at the carelessness of the public, saying that if citizens don't learn their lessons, the third wave of COVID-19 is not far away. Popular hill stations like Shimla, Musuri, Kufri, Narkanda, Dalhousie and Manali are witnessing the arrival of tourists in large numbers who are looking to get rid of the scorching heat in the northern plains. Due to the dip in COVID-19 cases, states like Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand have relaxed the restrictions which has led to an influx of the people from other states. A few days ago, pictures of crowded streets in Manali had gone viral. The increase in the number of tourists has also posed a challenge to the state government to ensure adhering of COVID-19 norms by the visitors amid fears of an impending third wave of coronavirus infections. The Union Health Ministry earlier on Tuesday expressed concern over people flocking to hill stations and markets without following COVID-19 appropriate behaviours and warned that such laxity can nullify the gains made in the management of the pandemic so far. That's all for tonight's English News Bulletin. Do subscribe to our channel and also follow Hornbill TV Official on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. I'm Esther. Have a good evening.